In this video, we're going to demonstrate some simple file reading and writing techniques for Java. So I've started off with this sort of simple project where I've got this demo class and I've got an empty main program for now. And I want to call your attention to the location on the hard drive where this project is residing. And right now, of course, there's simply the package file from BlueJ and the two files related to this empty class definition right here. What I'm going to do is I'm going to add a text file to this directory. I'm going to just say new and text document. Now I'm going to call my file input and <clears throat> it's important to note that the name of the file is actually input.txt even though the .txt, txt sorry the .txt suffix is hidden by the operating system. Uh, I never typed the .txt part, but as soon as I told Microsoft that I wanted a text file, it adds the .txt suffix to the file. We're going to open up this file, and we're going to edit it, and we're going to just add three lines. Uh, let's put a name in here in the first line that will act as a string. And then let's put a decimal number. And then finally, let's put a integer. I'm going to just save this file now. And I'm going to exit this, and now you can see this file is right here. And we're going to read that information from that file. So to do that, first of all, I'm going to be making use of the Java I.O. library. And I'll also be making use of the scanner class. As a reminder, we've used the scanner class before to read from the keyboard. We did stuff like scanner kb equals new scanner, and we did system.in. <clears throat> this was the way we attached the keyboard to the scanner, and then later on we were able to do stuff like uh, int n equals kb.nextInt. That should hopefully be familiar to you. What we're going to do now is we're going to do a very a similar type of thing, except this time instead of attaching the scanner to the keyboard, we're going to attach the scanner to a file. Okay, in fact, we're going to attach it to that input file that we had uh, created previously uh, in this directory right here. So to do that, what I'm going to do is I'm going to create a file object. I'm going to say file input file equals new file. And now I need to provide the path to this file right here. Since it's in the same directory, I don't need to put anything other than the name of the file. Notice that even though the .txt suffix is hidden here, I do need to provide it over here. And now you can see that the uh, compiler is complaining that there is an unreported exception. And what that means is when you do work with files, uh, there are often are a lot of errors associated with that. Uh, for example, the most common mistake is that the file may not be present either because you've mistyped it or it got moved or doesn't exist for some other reason. So <clears throat> what we're going to have to do is we're going to have to find some way to tell the compiler what to do if this file is not present and available for reading. Now one way to solve this is you can just put a simple throws exception here and what I'm doing here is I'm asking the operating system to handle the exception for me. So you can see the error is gone now. Now this is not going to be a good way for you to handle the errors because you're typically not going to be doing this work directly from the main method. So a better way to do this, well later in the video I'll show you a, a much better way to handle the errors. Let's leave this simple for now. And uh, now that I've created the scanner and the input file, uh, I'm going to be able to go in here and read uh, read these three fields inside the file. So first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to create a string variable and I'm going to say um, instead of calling this keyboard now I'll just call it in file like that okay because it's not the keyboard anymore it's an input file and now you can see I've attached the scanner to the input file and now I can use the scanner just as I did before so I can just go in file dot next line and this is how you read a string like that okay 
Uh, next, I'm going to read that decimal number. And that's how you read a decimal. And lastly, that's how you read an integer like that. Okay, so basically, I'm going to create a file. I'm going to open up the file. I'm going to read these three fields. And what I want to do after I've done that is I want to close up the file. That's kind of an important thing to do. So I'm going to just say in file dot close like that. Okay, that's a thing we have not previously seen with our previous uses of scanner. But when we do file IO, we want to add this command in at the end as well. All right. So now that we have these fields, let's print them out to the console to see if it act if the reading process actually worked. So let's go here. Uh, this is the file. And then we're going to do a similar thing with um, the decimal number and the integer. All right, let's try this out. So I'm going to compile and run it. <clears throat> I had this file open here previously. Let me close that up. And now I'm in a position to run the file run the program, compile and run. And you can see that I was able to read the file and print the contents over here. Okay, a uh, couple of changes we're going to make now. First is that instead of using this throws exception here, which is not going to be useful for your application because you're not going to be doing this from inside main, uh, a better way to do this is to use a try catch block. So I'm just going to add that right in here. And we've never seen this before. But what this does is basically it says try this and if you get into trouble, execute what, what it says in the catch block. We will learn much more about try catch blocks later in the course. But right now, uh, this is enough for us to survive. And what we'll do is, if we haven't, uh, if you run into any issues with the file, we'll just give a generic file error like that. Okay, let me just clean this up a little bit, and that's what the try catch block looks like. So the try catch block basically says, here you go, try all this stuff. If you run into a problem over here, run this catch statement over here. Okay, so I'm going to compile and run it again. And everything should work as before. And you can see it's working now. Let's just say that this file was gone for some reason. I'm going to just uh, change the name of the file to be uh, input Z or something like that, some different name than what it was before. And uh, let's run the file uh, program once again and see what happens when the input file is not there, making it bigger. There's the file error message. And you can see that that shows up because the file is not there. OK, let's restore the file name. And let's look at now how to do file output. So right now, uh, we were writing to the console. What I'm going to do instead is I'm going to use a print writer object to write to the a file instead. So I'm going to create another file object called output file. And I'll make that a text file also. Now, if you look at the directory over here, you'll see there is currently no output.txt file. And we don't have to create it manually because we're going to be able to create it from inside of our program. So I've created my output file like that. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to use this uh, print writer object like that. And I'm going to call this out file equals new print writer. And I'm going to just attach this file that I created to this print writer like that. Now, all I have to do at this point is instead of using system out println, I just have to change these to say out file 
Ln. So you can see that print writer is extremely similar to writing to the console. You just change the prefix on the println statements. Now let me just see what error I have here. Uh, looks like I need, did I misspell it? Let's see here, print, print, sorry, print, there's no ER here. And I used a capital O there. Okay, so now instead of writing to the console, we're going to be able to write to the file. Let's run this now. We ran it, and now look at the directory. And you can see that there's a new file here called output.txt. If I look in there, there's nothing. Oh, and this is actually a good example. I forgot to do something in my program. I forgot to close the file. So I have to go out file.close like that. And that was an important step that I left off. So let's run it again. And this time you can see that the file output has been populated with the items that were in the input file originally. Okay, so that's basic input output. Now, the last thing I want to show you on video is how do you read from a file when you don't know ahead of time how many lines are in the file? Let's create a file of team names. So I'm going to create another file now. And I'll call this names. And let's go in there and put some names. Here's like John Smith, Mary Doe, Franklin Sales. I think that's enough. Okay, so I put these three names in the file. And I'm going to just save the file and exit here. And let's say that in our program, instead of uh, knowing ahead of time exactly what was in here, we wanted to use a loop to try and read through the the the, uh, the input file and 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 print the uh, the names in another file. <clears throat> so to do that, uh, what I'm going to do is I'm still going to have my file definition, but instead of input file now, I'm going to use names.txt like that. Still going to use the scanner, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to use a while loop. Now this has next line method, it doesn't actually read the file. What it does is it just tells you if there's another line in it or not. So this will be true as long as there's another line that is yet to be read in the file. Now for our file, you can see there are three lines. So this loop will run three times. And so what I'll do is I will simply in the loop read the na next name. Uh, I don't think we need these things here. And um, I'll just move this output file creation over here. And uh, what we'll do is we'll simply print the name right after we read it to the output file. And then when we're all done, we'll remember to close both the input and the output files. OK, so there, that's that right there. All right, so let me see if uh, this compiles. Looks good, and let's run it again. So once again, what we're doing is we're going through the file. Each time we encounter another line, we're going to read the next name, and we're going to print that name to the output file. When we're all done with our loop, we're going to close both files and exit the program. So let's look at that. And now if I examine the output file, you can see that the names have transferred from the input file here to the output file. Okay. Uh, last thing I want to mention is that if you wanted to read this information into an array, it's a little bit tricky because typically ahead of time you don't know how many lines are going to be in the file. And so then the question becomes how do you size the array? And one way to do this is simply to oversize the array and make it larger than you need. 
So let's say I created something like this, a names array. <clears throat> and let's say I just went crazy here and put 50, just to make it a number larger than I'm ever going to need. Then what I could do is I could create an index that basically keeps track of where I am in the in the in the array and here um, I could go like that and assign the next name to the next free location in the array and of course I have to <clears throat> increment the index so that the next time it comes through here um, it, it's going to put it in a different location in the array. All right, and by the time you exit this while loop, you'll know exactly how many names you have in here. And at that point, you can either work with the you can either work with the uh, array with only it being partially filled, or if you like, you can create another array of exactly the size you need based on this index variable, and then copy the values from the big array, oversized array, into the exactly right sized array. So that would be another way to do it. Okay, that's it for this lesson.